Joe that lived around here for a long time. I do mean a long damn time. Been here, took care of my daddy, and my daddy's daddy. Took me up and killed over one day. on in Mississippi puts a white man in contact with a whole lot of black faces. I spent my whole life here, right here, in Candleland, surrounded by black faces. I see them every day, day in, day out. I, I only had one question. Shalom, all praise the Yahweh, Bashmi Asha, Double Line of the Apostles, GMS. My name is Amnila Allah. And what you just saw was a scene from the movie Jingle and Chain. Now, in that scene at a movie Jingle, Jingle and Chain, the character played by Leonardo DiCaprio, who was known as Calvin Candy, um, had brought out, had brought out a skull of someone they called Ben, old Ben, who three times a week shaved his father with a straight razor who never killed his father. And he said the science of phrenology is the key to understanding now it's, it's crucial to understanding the differences in the species. Now phrenology was an actual pseudoscience, a false science, that was actually um, widely regarded throughout different parts of the world um, during the period of slavery. And this is a website called um, The Guardian. As a matter of fact, when I went to a mo to the movies years ago to see um the, the movie Net the Nat Turner movie, I was actually interviewed by somebody from the Guardian, and I was with the brother Yaz and the guy was asking me questions, and we just straight up mentioned that we was Israelites, man. But and they put the video on um they put the interview on their website, but they never um they took out certain things that we said. Damn devils. But anyway, um, so in that movie they actually had historical facts that you actually had a science called phrenology. Now it says, Jingle Unchained and the Racist Science of Phrenology. 
Phrenology really was used to justify slavery, as portrayed by Django Unchained, but it was also used to justify abolition. Why don't they kill us, asked Calvin Candy, the southern slave owner in Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained. He wants to know why the, Af why the African slaves he brutalizes do not rise up and take revenge. Before long, he has a skull of a recently deceased slave on the, din on the dinner table. The science of phrenology announces is crucial to the understanding to understanding the separation of our two species. He hacks away at the back of the skull uh, at the back of the skull with the saw, removing the removing a section of the cranium and pointing to an allegedly enlarged area. In African slaves, Candy claims this bump found in the region of the brain associated with submissiveness. For Candy, phrenology not phrenology not only explains slavery, it justified it. Needless to say, Phrenology has now been thoroughly debunked. The idea that the shape of the skull can be used to infer mental characteristics, characteristics is just plain wrong. But it was extremely popular all over the world during the 19th century. Finding converts among reform-minded Bengalis in Kolkata, India, and colonial, and colonial settlers in Australia. As part of my research into the global history of phrenology, I came across the real-life Calvin Candy. He was called Charles Caldwell, a doctor from Kentucky who, who, who reveled in both phrenology and slave ownership. As in the film, Calvin was a Europhile, traveling like a person who has like a addiction or love for Europe, traveling to Paris in, in the um, 1820s, where he picked up the latest medical craze. <coughs> he later returned to France in the 1840s in order to hobnob with Pierre Marie de Moutier, a phrenologist just back from the three year round the world voyage. This is Charles Caldwell right here. It said, at the time, de Moutier's Intense collection of skulls and cast could be found at the Musée de Phrenology or Museum of Phrenology in France. There, Caldwell could practice phrenology, filling for bumps on the heads of Tahitians, Tahitians, and Marquesas Islanders. No doubt, he was considered a very considered very a la mode back in Kentucky. In fact, Caldwell even boasted of being one of the earliest experts in phrenology in the United States. Caldwell deployed phrenology in almost exactly the manner of the fictional candy. In 1837, he wrote to a friend claiming that tameableness explained the apparent ease with which Africans could be enslaved. Now, this is the reason why these damn devils are the damn devil. They came up with an actual science to try to justify putting our people in captivity. This was a standard phrenological for, 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 for argument. Areas located towards the top of the back of the skull, such as veronation and cautiousness, were routinely claimed to be large in Africans, which we are African Israelites. His correspondent concurred, writing that they are slaves because they are terrible. Clearly enjoying himself, Caldwell replied, depend upon it, my good friend, the Africans must have a master. See, areas of veneration and cautiousness should be large in Africans. You see that in different areas of the, brain, of the head right there? It says imitation, hope, so on and so forth, spirituality, benevolence. It's worth emphasizing that these words are not from a Tarantino script captured for Hollywood shock value. They were written by a slave owner desperate to preserve his brutal way of life. And while the physical violence of slavery is masked in Caldwell's letters, they, be they betray his warped sense of morality. In a letter written on Christmas Eve, 1838, Caldwell made the outrageous claim, my slave lives much more comfortably than I do. The fact that phrenology was used to justify slavery is perhaps unsurprising. What would, what would um, one expect from such an overtly racist science? It wasn't just the slavers. My research revealed that some of the most vocal anti-slavery campaigners of the 19th century were also advocates of phrenology and used it to justify their stance. So people who were um, anti-slavery used phrenology to justify their stance of being against slavery and will be why. Lucre Lucre Lucrezia Mott, Lucrezia Mott, Mott, a particularly uncompromising American abolitionist, sent her children to, phren to phrenological lectures and spoke of the truth of phrenology and led us to friends. When she visited Britain, she stayed with the renowned Scottish phrenologist George Combe, himself an anti-slavery campaigner. Horace Mann, another ma major figure in abolitionist politics, was so keen on phrenology that he subscribed to the official journal. After becoming president of Antioch College in Ohio, he even boasted in the same sentence that the professors he employed both anti-slavery men and avowed phrenologists. So people who were anti-slavery or slave abolitionists were phrenologists. They believed in the science of phrenology. Okay? 
These are not isolated examples. If anything, the majority of phenomenas were against slavery. How can this be? George Combe, a man whose phrenological books sold more copies during the 19th century than Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, explained his reasoning. The qualities which make them submit to slavery are a guarantee that if, emancip if emancipated and justly dealt with, they would not shed blood. For abolitionists, the apparent weakness and timid and timidity of Africans serve two purposes. It counter fears that they would take revenge on their masters if set free. It also provided a moral argument if Africans were innately weak. Society should help them, not enslave them. In the 19th century, scientific racism and abolition were by no means mutually exclusive. Now, see, it really didn't get that deep into phrenology. Let's see if we can get some a little bit deeper in the phrenology. Because it really didn't explain it. Okay. And then we get into the scriptures. All right, I'm going to go, right, I'm going to go to, um, right here, phrenology. All right, then I'm going to go right to the scripture. Phrenology, look on Wikipedia. Meaning mind, um, frame meaning mind, logos meaning knowledge. It's a pseudo-medicine primarily focused on measurements of the human skull based on the concept that the brain is the organ of the mind and that certain brain areas have localized specific fun functional modules. So you see this picture here and you see these different sections here? They believe that the brain has different sections. There are different characteristics located in different areas of the brain, okay? And by being able to measure the shape of the skull, you are measuring, therefore, the shape of the brain. The shape of the skull, the shape of the brain. Being that there are certain mental faculties located in the brain, if you measure that particular area of the skull, then you are then measuring the size of that particular area of the brain. So since the skull and the brain were the same size, if you measured the left side of a person's head, in that particular area of the head was associated with, let's say, stupidity. In that particular that particular area of the brain was let's say, was was associated with stupidity. Then it means that area. Um, if that area of the skull was large, then it means that the area, um, that it was over the brain, where stupidity was located. That means that person had a large tendency to be stupid. That's what they believed. See, look, for now to believe that the human mind has a set of various mental faculties, each one represented in a different area of the brain. For example, the faculty of um, philoprogenitiveness from the Greek for level offspring was located essentially at the back of the head. It sees as these areas were said to be proportional to a person's propensities. The importance of an organ was derived from the relative size compared to, to other organs. It was believed that the cranial skull, like a glove on the hand, accommodates to the different sizes of those areas of these areas of the brain, so that a person's capacity or given personality trait could be determined simply by measuring the area of the skull that overlies the corresponding area of the brain. So they believe the brain had these different faculties, these different personalities, these different traits, characteristics located in various areas. And if you measure the area of the skull just above that particular area of the brain, if that particular area of the skull was large, then that particular area of the brain where that trait was located had to be large too. So if a particular area of the skull was large and that was right over the area of the brain located with anger or wrath, then that person had a, and that area was large, then that person had to have a large tendency to be wrathful. So this is what Esau did. Esau came up with different sciences in order to, to justify slavery. Let's go to um, Genesis 3 and 1. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Right, the serpent was more subtle. Now serpent is not talking about an actual serpent, meaning an actual snake. It's talking about a man who, whose actions is that of a serpent. Let's go to Matthew's third chapter. Okay. This is Matthew chapter 3 verse 7. This is talking about John the Baptist. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So John the Baptist called the Pharisees and Sadducees vipers. But are they actual vipers? Are they actual snakes? No, they were men. They were human beings. But they had the characteristic of a snake. And a snake has what? A forked tongue. These people didn't actually have forked tongues, but a person who is a snake or a person who speaks with a forked tongue is a person who says one thing but does another. Okay? Strong's G, 2191. Echidna. 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 A viper, offspring of vipers, addressed to cunning, malignant, wicked men. So I'm talking about cunning, 
malignant, wicked men. To be malignant is to be wicked. To be cunning is to be skillfully deceitful. So he called them vipers, cunning and um, and malignant, wicked men. He said unto them, "All generations of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come." So he called them vipers because that's how they act like vipers. So he called men snakes. Oh, he's a snake. He says one thing nice.